Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the indigenous people across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. To the original caretakers of this land of which we stand, I acknowledge the land of the Huron Wenda, the Patton, Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the lands and resources around the Great Lakes, which is the area where I am right now. And I invite you, each and every one of you to acknowledge and recognize the, the territory and the, the land where you are. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Toro Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors. Beneath our feet, we acknowledge the land. Our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree, the Métis, the Dene, the Soto, the Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Inu, and all nations that came before us and those yet to come. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home, this, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and, pray and pay our respects to the indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. Once again, I acknowledge the land of the Huron Wendat, Petten, Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory, again, is covered by the dish with one spoon, one pump belt, covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Ojibwe and the allied nations to peacefully share and care for the lands and resources around the Great Lakes, which is the area where I am right now. So welcome to this uh, sixth webinar of Kairos. Um, and I want to start by thanking each and every one of you for, for joining us today. Without further ado, I would like to start and introduce our first um, guest speaker for this afternoon. Amari, who is going to share with us his own experience with the subject of um, work, open work permit for vulnerable workers. Amari, on to you. Yes, hello. Um, good morning to everyone. I'm Amari. Um, first, um, I work in the Philippines before I work abroad. I was born and raised in the Philippines. And um, I had to work abroad for my to provide um, financial assistance to my family. So I work in Dubai as a veterinary assistant for 18 months. Um, I was working like 57 hours a week without overtime pay in Dubai, as well as they they cut my 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 salary. They do it illegally, like one quarter of my salary. They cut it. So I search online for a job in Canada. Indeed, in Indeed, I saw this job as a they're hiring for a kennel attendant in Vernon, British Columbia. So I sent my resume, and the, the following day, I got a reply. So the employer told me that I will be scheduled for interview. So. Um, after the interview, she told me that she's going to process my papers. And then I waited for one year to finish all the, th all the 
all the paperwork. So I came here September 5, 2019 as a kennel attendant in Vernon as a temporary foreign worker. So I have a one year, one year contract. My, my job was kennel attendant, which, which is um, category C. So I'm thinking I would apply for a job which is like category B. So before my contract uh, finish, I did send resume to to some of the veterinary clinics here. So this veterinary clinic here in not to mention the, the name yeah. Uh, they interview interview me and then I passed the interview. They they process my LMIA so I came, um, I came here uh, December 9. So I have like two weeks. Um, um, I need to quarantine for two weeks in, in one of the hotel here. So I started working December 23. But I noticed there's like some attitude problem with my employer. It's like, I came here, it's really very cold and I have to walk from my cabin to, to the bus station. It's a long walk and I felt really exhausted. So, and then before work, working, um, the employer didn't treat me well. The, I always they always shouted in, on me, and then it's like so. It was not a good um, experience for me. This one time we had a surgery. Um, it happened that, you know, the gas anesthetic machine, it's isoflurane tank, uh, uh, spilled, I mean, uh, yeah. And then the doctor got mad. He threw the stethoscope away. He told me many, many things. He told me, go back to, to my home country. Then I left. It, it was January 6th. Um, her, his wife advised me to go just to go home. And January 8th, I received a call from them stating that he said that he's going to relocate me. But it didn't happen. Um, so January 10th, they pick me up, but instead of relocating me, it was all. Um, we went to his office, and then he gave me the termination letter, which states there that once I sign, they will give me ticket back home. Uh, they did give me at least two weeks notice. So I don't have any, any, any place to, to sleep, no food at all. So the only, the only option is to sign the documents, the termination letter. So what I did is I phoned the Filipino community but it's Sunday. 
they don't have any any office during that time. So I met a Filipino driver. So I took a, cha a chance to phone him. Luckily, he, he told me that I could go to his place. And uh, so I told my employer, I will not sign the documents. I will seek legal advice. And uh, so he didn't really push me through that. Um, so I went to my friend's apartment. Uh, I, I stayed there for two weeks. Uh, and I looked for a, a cheaper room for rent here. So his wife um, um, helped me with uh, to go to like immigration and um, service Canada. I did apply for EI, but it it took a bit of time before I get my before I received my EI and uh, lots of work with the uh, to apply for open work permit for vulnerable worker. So I have to you know, budget my money. So the immigration helped me with uh, application of my open work permit, uh, my sworn statement. I did the, uh, I did the, uh, what was that? Um, I gathered all the documents that was needed for application of work permit. So once it's done, I I mailed it to to immigration office, and eventually uh, it was denied. They are stating that it was stated that they are not satisfied with with my with the with the, all the requirements that I sent them. So my wife and I uh, agreed that uh, we apply for express entry. So it's just like we need like education requirements, um, language tests, and a proof of funds. So now we are waiting. Um, we are gathering all the documents that <coughs> we we need. We will be needing, and um, hopefully, we can we can finish the the express entry. Right now, I'm I'm still in on EI. And um, uh, a Filipino, still a Filipino uh, friend, uh, friend um, helped me uh, to find a, it's like a cheaper room for rent. So I'm staying here right now. So, yeah, that's my story. It's quite short. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amari. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to yeah. share your experience with us. And I know that it's not easy. So we sincerely thank you and uh, we invite you to, to remain with us for the rest of the webinar. So hopefully you might be able to get some information that may be useful uh, for you in the future. Uh, yeah. So move, we're going to move along here. Um, 
And I'm going to invite now to, I'm going to invite um, Mithi Esguera to speak. Uh, Mithi comes uh, from Quezon City in the Philippines. She moved to Canada at a very young age. And upon, upon ri arriving in Canada, she became involved with the Filipino community youth organizations. Uh, it was both a way to deal with her homesickness, but also yeah. she saw connection and common challenges among immigrant youth like herself. Most of whom were children of immigrant uh, or migrant caregivers themselves. Uh, Mithi has was also a board member of the Community Alliance for Social Justice, a coalition of Filipino community organizations advocating for various or various issues in the Filipino community. Mithi has a community worker diploma from George Brown College, but she also went to Ryerson University uh, for undergrad studies in social work and eventually decided to focus her time and energy on community organizing and also raising a beautiful family. So Mithi, it's all yours. So if you can unmute yourself and speak with us, please. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Alfredo. And thank you everyone for um, giving um, uh, MRCC a chance to share our uh, experience uh, in today's webinar. So I am currently working as the program coordinator at the Migrants Resource Center Canada. Um, I know I've met some of you in um, through the Kairos Partners meetings. Um, but for those who aren't familiar with MRCC, we're a um, nonprofit service organization um, serving um, migrant workers through three major program areas. So the first one is through our info and referral program where we provide one-on-one -on -one service and support for migrant workers. Um, we also have an education and training program where we um, provide building workshops and information sessions for, for migrant workers to build um, individual as well as um, organizational capacities. Um, and we also have our research and advocacy program where we um, collaborate. We collaborate with um, post-secondary institutions and, and um, academics to, you know, um, facilitate re community-based research to support our advocacy for migrant workers' rights. Um, so today I, I am going to be speaking directly from, from our experience in... Uh, um, working with migrant workers um, and exploring the uh, applications for open work permits for vulnerable workers. Be because our client base is really mixed, um, you know, we have we have some cli um, clients who are um, temporary foreign workers. We have some caregivers. We have some who have also you know, um, lost their status. For, they've had uh, different, uh, they were here with status from varying um, <clears throat> uh, situations and then they've lost it uh, for reasons beyond their control. So um, in terms of handling cases of applications for open work permits, we have, have, um, we have very few, but we have learned quite some very useful lessons um, you know, which we feel could guide us, you know, useful for other um, other organizations to learn who have no um, or little experience with it. Um, so looking at government provided information about the open work permit for vulnerable workers, um, this option is um, available for uh, workers who have a valid employer-specific work permit or have applied to renew one um, and are being abused or at risk or being of being abused. So in our experience, really, it's it's um, caregivers and uh, temporary foreign workers who are in this kind of uh, particular situation. And the types of abuse um, that we see can range from the more... Um, um, 
uh, the typical ones like the financial abuse, non-payment of wages, non-payment of overtime, like um, Amari was talking about. Um, and because the for for these workers, um, typically there's the element of you know uh, living in in a place that is provided by the employers for caregivers. It's their workers' home. For farm workers, it's um, in the farm. So it it the the physical abuse can also be in the form of um, yeah, unsuitable living conditions. Um, uh, other types of abuse can be. Uh, that are included or considered in um, applications for OWP for vulnerable workers is, um, of course, sexual abuse, psychological abuse. So these are things we've seen um, from our clients. Um, but to to illustrate it more in more concrete terms, I'd like to speak about two particular um, cases that we've handled. One is the first one is. Um, uh, a case which, in which we were successfully able to get um, an open work permit for the worker. And the second one is where we presented the option of applying for the OWP, but the workers um, chose not to proceed. Um, and I'll draw lessons from both. So for the first one, um, Sorry, can you still hear me? Because my screen is frozen right now, so I'm not sure if I'm still connected. Thanks. No, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Um, so in the first case, um, eh, this is very recent, this is, and this is the uh, successful one that we've, we've handled, is the case of a, um, a in-home caregiver uh, who came, who had already experienced was in, in another province, but she had already experienced abuse from there. And she moved here to Ontario, um, uh, started working for another employer and ended up being abused again. And this all happened um, during the time of the pandemic. So, um, and I, I asked for her consent to share um, some of the information about uh, her case and she, she consented to um, and I assured her that I won't uh, divulge. She wasn't paid holiday pay, um, overtime pay, and I think even her regular pay was not complete. Um, she also experienced psychological abuse in that when she tried to assert her rights um, in terms of, um, you know, she was being made to do uh, excessive work that was not even in her in her contract. She has tried to assert it, and the employer responded by threatening to have her deported. Um, spoke to her in a in a very meaning and a demeaning and very detail. But um, so this is from the first employer. Second employer when she moved. Um, the employer was limiting her mobility and using COVID-19 uh, as an excuse. So in the, it was in, she was already in this situation when we met her. Um, and she had already been working with a, a trusted lawyer in our network. So the lawyer actually approached us and uh, you know, said, can you provide some support for this worker? I've already started. Um, gathering information and evidence to support an application for open work permits. So for this one, uh, for, for this particular worker, what we did in working with, with the lawyer, we, um, for, first thing we had to do was to get uh, the full story and get the, the, the story, um, uh, be able to have a clear idea of the sequence of events and the the types of abuse, the nature of the abuse that was happening. So we got the, the worker to document that. And the thing with um, her and us, same, same thing with, that we find with other workers in distress is that um, when they tell their story, they, they will, whatever is the most, um, I guess, um, 
severe or the most uh, prominent um, event uh, in their mind uh, or the most traumatic event, that's the, the one that they keep repeating and repeating. So in the initial contact with the worker, it was kind of challenging to um, you know, to di discern the sequence of events and, you know, everything that was happening. So the first step had to be, you know, to document all of that and then verify with the worker if we, we were understanding it correctly and, um, you know, asking her to fill in the gaps um, where we think <clears throat> we didn't have a clear understanding of what was happening. So once we established that, you know, these were the types of abuse that she had been experiencing, um, what we had to do was um uh look at the requirements uh the required documents or that we needed to provide um to accompany the application to substantiate the the claim that there is abuse happening so for the financial abuse we got copies uh we we got the worker to provide copies of um, the e-transfers, you know, the, the documentation of those e-transfers, and also WhatsApp messages exchanged between her and the employer discussing financial uh, matters or financial arrangements. Um, Oops, it actually looks like we might have lost connection with Mizi. But in the meantime, um, we can move on and... I would like to maybe ask uh, Luis, our next speaker, to get ready. Uh, and I'll just do a quick intro introduction. Um, so Luis Alberto Mata is uh, an anti-human traffic, trafficking uh, migrant workers program coordinator at uh, FCJ Refugee Center in Toronto. Um, Luis is a refugee from Colombia uh, and in Canada has worked with migrant and refugees during the last 11 years. Uh, in his native Colombia, he was a writer and a human rights activist. And so it is, it is an, uh, an honor and a privilege to have Luis um, share with us his um, experience with um, these issues that we are discussing today in this webinar. So Luis, it's all to you. The microphone is yours. Thank you, um, Alfredo. Thank you for the invitation. For, um, it's an honor for me to be with Kairos and, and this group of amazing people that I know committed with human rights and, and migrant workers in, in Canada. Um, I'm, I'm coming here in representation of FCJ Refugee Center where I work. Uh, FCJ, I, I imagine most of you know about FCJ. I'm going to be very brief. It's a non-profit organization, a community-based organization, uh, offering a uh, holistic uh, uh, services uh, approach and services to migrants in precarious status in, uh, and refugees in, in, in Canada, particularly in Ontario, Toronto. We have uh, programs in, for, uh, for refugees. Uh, we have uh, programs for popular education, supporting those who have no access to education because the situation of not immigration status. We have a primary health clinic offering support with a doctor who is a, a volunteer and a nurse offering the basic attention for those who have no or hip the, in Toronto. And also, sorry, we have the um, an anti-human trafficking program. That is the program I am one of the coordinators. Uh, the head of the program is the, my supervisor and co-director of the FCJ, Lori Rico, who is the founder of the program and also the founder of the organization. With a hey, Luis. Move on. Um, very briefly, uh, in FCJ, we have several programs right now related to uh, migrants in precarious situation, particularly victims of human trafficking. And we focus in cases, means those who, ha who are uh, foreign um, uh, workers who are here and in a very precarious situation in the immigration. And most of them, uh, we attend, we, we uh, serve those who are in a non-status at all. For that, we created uh, the Migrant Workers Mobile Program. That is a program that we, before the pandemic, we used to go, uh, we went to the different locations in Peel region, in, in, in London, in 
even in Windsor, in a, in a, in a coalition with the, uh, the legal of Windsor there. And we have been in several parts of the province, but now with the pandemic, we have been oper operating mostly online. Um, we have at Utah Alliance, uh, Migrant Workers uh, uh, Counter Human Trafficking Alliance. We have been uh, leading these uh, initiatives, trying to get connections, partnership, collaboration, and sharing best practices, and trying to, to get together against uh, uh, labor, labor exploitation. Um, for today, for today, uh, I was invited to, to talk about the open work permit for vulnerable workers. One of the remedies we have on place in, in this moment to support uh, migrant workers who have been victims of exploitation, labor abuses, or other situations in, on, on the places of work. Just very briefly about the, the, the open work permit, because I, I know my colleagues and my, the other speakers are going to talk a little bit more in, in depth about the, the technicalities of the, of the open work permit. Just to, to mention that the human trafficking or labor exploitation, labor abuses happen everywhere, uh, even just around the corner can be happening, but especially in those places that are, are isolated or in those places where are migrant workers who have limitations in communication with the language or a precarious situation in, in their immigration, then those are more vulnerable and more easy to be victims uh, of labor abuses and labor exploitation. One of the situations we have, we have seen in the last period is that workers who come here with tight work permits, tight means with the name of the employer in the work permit. Uh, um, we, ha we have seen a lot of abuses, in the, especially in the factories and in, in the farms, also in restaurants uh, in the past, uh, in which those workers who came here with a, with a, a specific employer and a, and a specific uh, 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 tight work permit, they have been victims of, of many abuses and that was the reason that after the advocacy and several initiatives from the community when the organizations and advocates finally the government created this uh, this uh, uh, tool that is called the open work Permit for vulnerable workers so basically is a, um, an avenue for the workers to leave the place of abuse and to get an open work permit but this i'm going to talk a little bit about this this open work permit some things that we have seen in the in the open work permit that is uh, um, a little bit gaps or negative is the inconsistency in the way what the evidence of abuse is accepted the way the way the workers can sustain that that they were facing abuse in order to be granted with this work permit i'm going to explain this with an example there was a group of guatemalans in bc um, they were uh, working in a farm Mm, they were abused. They were uh, not paid in the in in, in the overtime. Uh, they were suffering discrimination. Especially one of the one of the administrators were, was also from Guatemala, Guatemalan Canadian person, and this person was taking advantage of the situation. He is speak Spanish and English, and then he, he went taking a little uh, um, uh, over the workers uh, with tasks, also maltreating them with words. Uh, uh, discriminated them, um, and the owner of the farmer was admitting that this to happen because that was happened between the Guatemalan. What was the the, the 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 way he described the situation? And the worker was suffering a lot of psychological abuse, and they were classifying the good and bad workers. Um, they told us that those good workers were those who didn't complain, those who work without uh, saying that they were sick that uh, those who were uh, not asking for permissions, etc., those they were the, the good workers, but those who were just complaining because the overtime, because, uh, because illegal deductions from the payment. Like, for instance, they were getting a deduction from housing that was an abusive situation because it's not contemplating the, in, 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 at least in that contract and in that farm, but they were getting deductions, abusive deduction for, for housing other deductions for transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Then those who were complaining, they were classified as a bad workers um, and threatening that they are not gonna be uh, invited to come the, the following year. A group of them, three of them just left, they flee the, the place because one day there was a flight and they were accused that 
or were violent, they were accused that they were uh, and threatened that, were, that the police was going to come and to take them uh, to jail, etc. Then they decided to leave the place in in in, in BC uh, because they had a friend in in London, Ontario. They decided to come to Ontario just because they have a friend. For them, it was like an adventure to cross all Canada. They are coming from a very small country in Central America. And when they described the situation, the traveling, for them, there was an adventure. But they were just scared uh, with this situation, trying to find uh, uh, where, where to escape and, and, and where to live and where to find a job. When they were in, in, in London, uh, one of the friends, uh, fortunately, was attending sometime a webinar, um, an info session we provided in London. Uh, with one of our partners, um, and we were supporting him with a um, humanitarian and compassion application, an agency. This person connected the workers with FCJ Refugee Center. When we met the workers, we were surprised all of them had the, the, the work permit valid, still valid for several months. <clears throat> um, and they were telling us the story about what happened in, in, in BC. We tried to find colleagues and, and partners in BC to find a little bit more information. And we discovered that in that farm, it's not the first time, it's several times have been happening issues in that place. When we presented them to the, to, to, we did application for the, for the open work permit um, for vulnerable workers. Um, the only proof we couldn't submit was an affidavit, a declaration, a note, uh, made for the workers saying that they that what they were saying was true. Um, they just have they just have a little some a few chats in the WhatsApp, a few pictures, but they don't have en enough evidence. Even though in the website and in the in the guidelines of this application say that evidence um, is not mandatory, is not is not uh, has not to be one condition in order to be uh, uh, granted with this uh, with this open work permit, they were denied with the open work permit because two things. One, the officer said that they didn't make any complaint in BC. Second, they abandoned the place um, and they came to another province. And third, they didn't have any, any physical or any uh, proof, like a video recording or something in order to, to show the evidence that they were abused in that in that place. That is thing that we found very difficult. Uh, these workers were in distress. They were crying. They were saying, "No, we we did we did well. The only thing we complained that we we were not involved in the fight, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Anyway, we did as much as possible, as many as possible things. Uh, uh, we we tried to to put letters. Um, also, FCJ wrote a letter, etc. But Anyway, this application was not approved. Mm, those is, this is one of the gaps we have been finding in the in the in the in the this open work permit for vulnerable workers. The other one is when when the permit is allowed, when this granted, we have found another gaps. There is no family reunification. There is no pathways to permanent residency. It is just a temporal solution, just to extend the suffering of the worker for one more year. And I say extend because. I'm gonna explain this with another case. We have a worker from the Caribbean, Kale, I'm just using fake names. Kale uh, uh, suffered a lot of abuses in a, in a farm, uh, also deduction, illegal deduction, maltreatment as a person, as a human being. And, and, and he, he, he wasn't getting enough pay for the overtime, etc. Fortunately, he had some pictures about the housing condition. He had some recordings and this open work permit was granted to Kale. But Kale got this, op this open work permit and he tried to find job, a job, uh, an employer willing to, to give him an LMIA and to hide him again to get back to a tight work permit, means a closed work permit with an employer. <clears throat> he couldn't find this employer on time. And then uh, now, uh, Kale is in the situation that his work permit is not going to be extended because another gap, this, the open work permit for vulnerable workers is not possible to be extended, has no pathways to extension. Then this is another gap I wanted to explain uh, with, um, um, with, the, with, with the open work permit that, that apart from not having any uh, possibilities for the worker to extend the stay in the country, 
to have some pathways to family relocation to, to permanent residence is just one year for the worker to find to find another employment. We have clients from Mexico, for instance, that they have limitations in language and, and they also able to find another job. Then the second, the plan B we have for the, uh, we have for these cases is to apply to support them applying for HNC for humanitarian and compassion application. But in general, that, that is that I wanted to tell about the open work permit. Uh, um, the open work permit was introduced in 2019. It's valid only, only for 12 months. It's, it's, a, it's available for individuals who hold a valid work permit uh, or, or who have an employee status. Uh, spouse, and the, spouse and dependents may be eligible if they are here only, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a no easy, an easy possibility. Fortunately, the only thing is they don't have uh, to pay any fees for the application. Um, and unfortunately, again, they must provide evidence of the exploitation in the, in the workplace, even though in the guidelines say that it's no mandatory. That are the, the, the things I wanted to mention about um, this tool, and I'm open to questions or to comment in, in the next stage. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you so much, Luis. That's, that's, that's great. Um, I wanted to, before moving on to, um, before moving on to um, Francie, Francie our, our last speaker, I wanted to take maybe a couple of minutes in case Mithi has something that she wanted to tell us to close and conclude her presentation, because unfortunately she got cut off. It, it, I hope you don't mind, Francie. And uh, we'll just give Mithi a couple of minutes. Is that okay, Mithi, or you're okay? Um, so, yeah, I, yeah. I just uh, I have some a few things to add. Just to, okay, to great. Share. So let's take a couple of minutes. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, sorry if I got disconnected for some reason. But anyway, uh, what I was just sharing is just the uh, things that we, the measures that we took, and the evidence that we gathered in order to support this worker. Um, in her application for an open work per permit, um, so we, we, you know, we gathered all those um, um, documents um, to present as evidence, um, and it even even before before submitting the application for the OWP, the lawyer had also um, filed uh, employment standards claim for for the worker, um, and that was also presented um, in, along with the application. Um, now this is like this is um, you know a, a situation where we uh, tried as much as possible um, to cover all all the bases, like to prove all those uh, abuse um, and uh, present evidence for each each of the claims. But like Louis said, uh, it's there's an inconsistency in what is what is accepted as as evidence. Um, in in working with other service providers, they they some of them didn't have to go through that whole um, process and didn't have to um, submit uh, all those types of documents, but got approved. Um, but you know, in, I, I think the lesson for us is if there is, if it's possible to to gather as much evidence. But the other um, experience that we've had, and this time it's with farm workers, um, is um, uh, for them they were their issues were um, the unsuitable. Uh, living conditions, the um, verbal abuse by a uh, um, also um, um, conflicts in the workplace that you know are are not addressed by by the supervisor or by management, um, uh, and, and injuries uh, that workers experience that are not properly properly responded to. to. So obviously there's there's basis, but um, and the, we are approached by three workers from one workplace. And for this one, our approach was first to, um, you know, to to do uh, to gather them and give them rights education and you know show them yes, you are correct in in saying that you are experiencing abuse and your rights are being violated. Um, and we presented the, we didn't tell them to apply. We didn't say here you should apply for OWP, um, but we said to them this is an option. Um, 
but in this case the workers had different um you know they had um different things uh, in mind um um one thing we suggested to them is um if you can uh, you can approach your the higher management and tell them about what's happening with the supervisor um and then if they if the manager refuses to address it we can add that as evidence for your application to OWP but they said it's not going to be effective because we know what the response is going to be um we know the politics inside the workplace um and so in the end they all um the three workers who had um spoken to us one of them left the work workplace a couple of months after the other two left the workplace and now they're just trying to find um uh, other employment so um you know but what we were telling them is when we presented the option of the OWP to them we said this is an option it's not permanent that you have an uh, an open work permit forever after this it just buys you some time if you know if your work permit for example is about to expire it will give you um some more time to find another employer um and retain you know stay here and work because they've got families that they're sending money to back home um but for them it was you know rather than going through all these um you know the process of writing everything out gathering evidence and all of that for them the urgent thing was the most urgent thing was to continue to um um earn money so that they can continue to support their families back home um and for us you know if that's the choice of the worker it's fine because ultimately it's up to them to determine with what they think is is the best course of action for them um but out of you know the, the these experiences uh i think for us as service pro as service providers um when we are uh when we have workers approaching us uh who are uh you know uh faced with situations of abuse um like i said before the onus is on us to really gather the information and you know make the recommendation to the worker but um uh let them decide if they decide to go for the open work permit then um as much as possible what we have to do is uh, cover all the bases um and then for me in in the case of the caregiver um who did get the open work permit the collaboration among different service providers was really very instrumental because you know the the letters of support um all these people that she had approached or even talked to after each instance of abuse they were able to provide something in writing to um to um say that yes i heard i was approached by this worker and she told me that she experienced this so um that's it but beyond lastly beyond the service approach uh, i think really um it's true um like luis was saying this is a very uh, small measure that um uh, it really doesn't solve the greater issues um and challenges that are faced by migrant workers for us we think in in approaching workers even as we're presenting the option of the OWP with them we give them the right education um because we think that uh, as when they understand what their rights are um and they you know they feel confident that they are they're not imagining things then it's not just in their mind that abuse is happening happening then they're more empowered and and they're more willing to also work collectively with other migrant workers to to address the bigger issues um and that's all i wanted to share thank you very much thank you so much mithi i think i i um before we move on i want to thank you for the effort of coming back in despite the the connection problems but so thanks so much and uh, um i want to introduce our last um, speaker today and um also want to encourage you if you have any questions uh please uh make a note of the questions and uh, after uh francis presentation we will have a question and answer period uh in the meantime if you want to put your questions in the chat that would be also acceptable and we're going to try to keep track of that uh, but um, I want to introduce our um, 
last speaker for this afternoon. Uh, Francie, I want to check with you. Your last name is Munoz or Munoz? It's Munoz, but you can say Munoz as everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, sounds, it sounds strange to me, so I'm just, if you don't mind, I'm just going to say Francie Munoz. Uh, community legal work. Thank you. Uh, Francie has worked at the Windsor Essex uh, Bilingual uh, Legal Clinic for 10 years as a community legal worker. Uh, she speaks Spanish, has a law degree and a master's degree in administrative law from her home country in Colombia. Um, she studied the paralegal and the language interpreter program at St. Clair College and is currently a candidate awaiting her call to the Bar of Ontario. Uh, since 2017, she has led successfully the Care for International Workers Program and the Spanish Speaking Clients Program at the Windsor Essex Bilingual uh, Legal Clinic. Uh, thank you, Francie, for accepting to be with us. And I'm just going to get ready here to open up your presentation. Okay, thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Francie Munoz from the Windsor Essex Bilingual Legal Clinic. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Uh, the Windsor Essex Bilingual Legal Clinic is a non-profit community clinic funded by Legal Aid Ontario. Uh, we serve people with low income living in the region of Windsor and Essex County. And we provide legal services in, in different matters like employment law, immigration law, housing law, social benefits, small claims, et cetera. Because uh, migrant workers are vulnerable workers, we offer free legal services for them. We are able to provide legal advice and representation when they need. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about the legal requirements to apply for an open work permit for vulnerable workers. This is a disclaimer. The, this presentation is not going to replace the immigration and refugee protection regulations. It's just used um, for legal information to provide legal information for you. And it's not going to think as a legal advice for everybody. It's not a solicitor client relationship that arises as a result of this access to the video or presentation. And for information and advice, you can reach uh, the other legal clinics or experienced lawyers in your jurisdiction, uh, we are going to review your file according to your specific situation. And we have two types of work permits. One is the employer specific permit. It's also called the closed work permit. Closed work permit. It's a specific work permit that allows workers to work accordingly to the conditions on the work permits. So workers can only work for a specific employer, for a employer time, sorry, for a specific occupation and for a specific occupation. All of that of the so and see what are the conditions to stay here. Workers cannot apply to extend their work permits. So if the employer may want to rehire the new worker, that worker country before they can apply for another. The agricultural stream that is the other stream that they came to Canada, worker cannot apply for an extension also. And if workers wants to change jobs or change employers, they can do it, but they must apply for a new work permit from inside of Canada. To change the employers, workers may apply to change the conditions of the work permit, and the employer must give the workers some requirements too. The employer has to give the workers a new job offer letter, a new labor market impact assessment number, a new contract signed by the workers and the future employer. Also, for the temporary foreign workers, there is another option available they actually can extend their participation or change their international experience Canada work permit. Either they will be working at the same employer and at the same location and their job duties won't change in the future. Future. The other type of work permits in Canada is the open work permit. The open work permit for vulnerable workers is the permit that we are talking today. Um, and the open work permit allows workers to work in for any employer in Canada. Now there is a, a, a new program, you know, no new is in 2019 it started is the open work permit for vulnerable workers. So I'm going to refer in the second slides to the requirements and eligibility for this kind of program. Generally, 
people who obtain an open work permit in Canada have some other type of status in Canada. So you can see that the people that um, immediately get an, an open work permit is people that is under the protection program, that means protected person, or first stage approval of the humanitarian and compassionate grounds, or are refugee claimants, or are permanent residents, or are citizens. Now, with an open work permit workers, uh, they are allowed to extend their conditions on the work permit. This is a this is the exception of the other work permit. So if you had an open work permit, you can extend or change their conditions on the work permits in general, but it's not applicable for the temporary foreign workers under the vulnerable application. This work permit uh, doesn't confer a temporary resident status. It's just an open work permit, it's just a permit. Okay, and now the open work permit for vulnerable workers, it was launched as um, Luis mentioned, it was uh, uh, launched in June 4, 2019. The section 207, it was changed and the uh, IR, IRRP uh, give the IRCC the authority to issue a open work permit for temporary foreign workers that holding an employer specific work permit and who were experiencing abuse or are in risk of abuse in the context of their employment. So in summary, the Open Work Permit for Vulnerable Workers is a program that allow migrant workers in Canada who are experiencing abuse or who are at risk of abuse in the context of their employment in Canada that to be eligible to receive an Open Work Permit that is exempt from the labor market impact assessment LMII process. What are the requirements? Okay, the requirements in order to apply for an open work permit for vulnerable workers are the following. The temporary foreign worker must be in Canada. The temporary foreign worker must hold a valid employer specific work permit or have submitted a work permit extension application for the same employer and is currently in Canada on implied status. What is implied status? This means a temporary foreign worker that is precluded to apply for an individual uh, work permit if he has lost the status. But the government give to the worker, not the government, the immigration regulations give to the worker a 90 days period or a implied status period for restoration. Restoration of the status. Okay, the temporary foreign worker uh, that is either experiencing abuse or risk of experience abuse is eligible for apply for this kind of work permit. Okay, the eligibility. To be eligible, workers must be in a status. That means they have to have a valid open work permit that requires a LMI, or they have had a valid closed work permit that is exempted of LMI or they can be authorized to work without a work permit under the implied status that I already mentioned to you, that is the 90 days of implied status. There is no fee to apply, this application is free, and the length of the permit is up to the officer. So the immigration officer decides how much you can stay in Canada under this kind of work permit. Usually it's one year. Okay, now I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to you about the abuse. What is abuse? Abuse can be a physical abuse that includes assault or forcible confinement. Maybe sexual abuse that includes sexual contact without consent. It can be psychological abuse that includes threats and intimidation. It can be financial abuse that includes fraud and extortion or not paying wages owed to the worker or maybe stealing or taking a worker's money, salary, or checks, or coercing them into giving them up. It's something like the same like happened to Amar. <laughs> it's similar. Okay, uh, the next please, Alfredo. Thank you. I'm going to tell you what are some of the examples of the abuse or risks of abuse. For example, the employer, the recruiter, or both have coerced the migrant workers into paying job placement or recruited fees. For example, the employer on several occasions doesn't pay the wages owed to the migrant worker. Another example, the migrant worker on several occasions is harassed. What does mean harassed? Is for example, he doesn't want an uh, unwanted physical or verbal behavior that is offending or humiliating the person. Uh, 
uh, everything is in the, in the environment of the workplace. So if he doesn't feel comfortable with that kind of uh, unwanted behaviors, this is a kind of abuse. Another example, the migrant worker is threatened by the employer if they complain about their work conditions. If, for example, the worker tried to reach uh, the Ministry of Labor or, or try to reach another agency or community in order to know about the rights and the employer just treating the worker and saying, no, you cannot, this is abuse. Another example, forcing or pressuring the migrant worker to perform work that contravenes the conditions of the work permit. That's me. I, I mentioned before, uh, the work permit has some conditions implied. If you see the work permit, as soon as the immigration gave the work permit, you can see what, what are the conditions that you have to, to meet. And if the employer say, no, uh, I'm going to change your conditions. You are not going to work here. You are going to work in a different farm. You are going to work for a different kind of activities. This is an abuse. Why? Because it's contravening your work permit. This is also a form of coerced engagement in illegal, in illegal activity. It's not allowed. And maybe also accompanied by enable for their threats, intimidation, or abuse. Also, there is abuse when the worker, when the employer insult the worker, uh, intimidate, intimidating the worker, humiliating the worker, harassing the worker, threatening the worker with, rel with respect to the immigration status or deportation. Sometimes um, the employer say, if you don't do this, I'm going to call the immigration office and you can be deported. And this is not right. This is an abuse. And also it's an abuse against the temporary for a worker program in Canada. Also it's abuse when the employer name calling you or yelling you or blaming you or shaming you or ridiculing the worker or disrespecting the worker or criticize the worker in front of others. Also, it's abuse when the migrant worker may not be uh, directly experience abuse, but he see that there are other workers that are experiencing abuse. So he will be in risk to be another worker under the abuse situation. With the, with the new COVID-19, uh, we experience more clients just complain about different kind of abuse. So it wasn't enough just all the abuse that we already mentioned, that there are more abuses during the COVID-19. So what kind of abuses happened during the COVID-19 related to the working and living conditions of the migrant workers? So we can see the employer doesn't provide wages always during the mandatory quarantine or isolation period who put entry to Canada or the migrant worker is forced or pressured to perform work that violates the conditions of mandatory quarantine or isolation period, or the worker is forced to work when showing symptoms of COVID, or also the migrant workers is prevented from seeking medical assistance. We in, have some clients that they call us because um, at the beginning of the pandemic, they didn't receive any treatment. They didn't receive any, even water, no water, no medication, no Tylenol, no anything. So it, it was very hard time for them at the beginning. After that, everything was changed and new regulations were just uh, encouraged employers and also gave recommendations to employers to follow the, the mandatory requirements uh, and measures of COVID. But it happens at the beginning. Uh, also, it's abuse when the worker is not provided with adequate tools and working conditions to implement, implement public health and social distancing protocols. We also notice in some farms, uh, also at the beginning, uh, they are working in four rows, between four rows. So uh, one worker here and the next worker um, next to, to the other worker uh, in a distance of, um, how do you say, no more than 10 centimeters. That's mean one in the furrow, one well, in the other one in the other furrow, and the other one in the other furrow, no keeping any, any measures, any distance for COVID-19. Just after a few months later, the government and the other regulations start changing that and putting, putting more regulations and more recommendations to the employers into the farms. Another kind of abuse that we experienced during the COVID is was the reprisals many reprisals actions against workers to, for taking sick leave or for refusing to work 
or because of course they were sick, most of their workers in Limington, especially they were very sick. They were a worker, uh, they were working even with COVID. They were working even uh, if they don't have COVID, uh, they were forced to work with the other workers with COVID. So it was crazy times, but it that happened, it was abuse. Also it's abuse when the employer, uh, for example, doesn't provide appropriate inadequate accommodations for quarantine uh, during the isolation period or the prevention of virus, virus spread. Also, when the employer didn't provide workers with cleaning products or with didn't, the employer didn't prevent the spread uh, in the shared accommodations, like for example, in the rooms, if they are sleeping, uh, there is not the requirement distance and there are not uh, cleaning products uh, there are not uh, any accommodations for the people that are sleeping at the same room. So it was a, a hard time of abuse also. Uh, also, we saw the employer prevents the worker uh, from obtaining essential items during the quarantine or isolation period. For example, um, the employer usually at the beginning of the pandemic was reluctant to let the worker to go outside to buy groceries or to get medication or um, uh, provide any any adequate things, basic things that the worker need. So this is also also abuse. Sometimes um, uh, I remember the the workers was complained because the employers didn't provide the basic thing like like for example. Uh, I know it's basic. The internet now is basic. So sometimes the employer just refuse to provide the internet or refuse to let the worker to get pick up food or sometimes even even the, even connected with the family or something like that or even use the cell phones we noticed uh, some kind of complaints during the COVID-19 at the beginning so this is another uh, ways of abuse okay how to apply uh, in order to apply for this kind of uh, application, Open Work Permit for Temporary work, Vulnerable Workers, uh, you can apply online directly to the IRCC website, uh, and you can include supporting evidence of the abuse that all of the speakers today mentioned is not easy uh, to provide the support documents that they need and they want to see. But usually that in my experience and as a service provider in um, the bilingual legal clinic, we provide the enough supporting evidence in order to get a approval of all work permits that we submit. So we usually uh, attach to the application a description of the abuse. We usually attach a letter, a statement of report from the abuse. We usually provide a sworn statement or affidavit of the worker. We provide a copy of an official complaint for filed uh, with an enforcement agency. We, for example, um, usually in, in, in bilingual legal clinic, we have many clients that apply for um, that complaint, no apply, that complaint to the, directly to the Ministry of Labor or to complain direct, directly to the police or complain directly to the, to the um, human rights um, tribunal. So all of, all of these complaints are very important and have the basis to be approved or successfully in an open work permit for vulnerable workers. So uh, I really recommend uh, all the agencies or service providers have the complete documents. Uh, I know it's not mandatory, but it never is enough. So as if you can provide more, more and more, uh, everything is works during, in this kind of work permit. But the most important thing is the official document provided by the authority, the informant's agency. It can be a police report, it can be a human rights application, or it can be um, a Ministry of Labor application. Also, the, the worker can mm, attach the copy of the acknowledgement, the letter of the receipt of the tribunal, uh, and submit the application, copy of the application of the number provided by the agencies, like, the, for example, the Employment Standard Branch, they provide a reference number 
when, uh, when a worker provides an application, or also the Human Rights Tribunal, when you apply, they provide you a reference number. So uh, attach the reference number. Uh, if it's possible, attach the, all the application of human rights in order to get approved or the police report. There are also supporting or additional materials that you have to provide, like, for example, the victim impact statement. You can provide hard copies of email messages. You can provide photos showing inquiries or working conditions, uh, showing, for example, um, the bad conditions of the workplace, or, for example, showing uh, um, what else? the conditions yeah the conditions in the even in the workplace so you have, don't have the tools or you don't have a safety conditions in your workplace everything counts so you, you have the possibility to take pictures it's okay sometimes the workers uh, when approach the clinic they ask what can i what can i suit me to prove my my abuse and i recommend you uh, please take pictures. I know sometimes it's not allowed for the, you know, the first, they didn't allow the workers to do that, but most of them they can at night or at any time they can take pictures. I also receive videos, I also receive audios, also I receive many meetings during the, the meetings with the farmers and the farms are treating in the workers and all of that evidence, it counts. So we can submit a DVD, we can submit a USB, we can submit any proof. And even witness testimonies, it's always requirement to have a witness testimony. Okay, here uh, you can see a list of resources available for migrant workers. It's not uh, the exhausted list. There are more, of course, more resources. There are more agencies that are able to provide different kind of services. This is just in the Windsor region and the other, uh, I think the justice for migrant workers. And there are others also here that are not just in the region. You can reach any agency, community agency, or legal clinic or any agency that can provide you any assistance or help during this application will be fine. Uh, you can contact any list of any, any of the agencies in the list. The form numbers are here in the screen. So you can contact us or contact any of the agencies that you prefer. Next, please, Alfredo. Oh. The next one, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. If you have any questions, uh, I'm so happy to provide the answers or any other the speakers also will be so happy to explain or answer your questions. Thank you so much. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, Francie, this is great and uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, so this is uh, your chance. I Before we open it for questions, um, Okay, I can see um, Aswani, floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have actually a lot of questions, um, but I don't know, let me know when can I stop. I start with the first one. <laughs> so, um, and this is to Francie. Francie, so what happens uh, when the work permit uh, ends? Like you say that is, uh, um, the work permit is for a specific time of period then ends. So I am imagining at that time, the worker has to go back to their country. But for the situation of agricultural workers, they go back to their country and they can they apply the next year again to come in, in, in the permit of the swap program, or there is some kind of restrictions. Uh, okay. Um... Any particular situation is different. So uh, this is a, just a general explanation about my experience as a service provider, but we have to see any particular situation of any worker because everything is different. But usually uh, at the end of the open work permit for vulnerable workers, uh, they don't have any option for an extension. So um, if the open work permit expire, uh, the only option is if it's under the seasonal agricultural worker program, is just come back to, the con to their countries and wait for a new offer of employment and apply for a new work permit to came to Canada probably the next year or two years, depends on the recruitment step or depends on the mandatory requirements from the uh, treatment, the, yes, for the convenio, what is the name, <laughs> for the trade, uh, Mexican and Canada. Trade. 
So it uh, depends. Uh, there is another situation, for example, um, I have cases with some mm, workers that we were successful in the application. Uh, they got an open work permit for vulnerable workers and they were lucky and they find a job, not in the far area, they find a job in a different area activity. They find a job in a tomato factory, they find a job in a construction company and they were hired full time. What happened with them? They were hired full time, the, the employer gave the opportunity to work, of course, more than one year, but what happened when the work permit expired? Before the work permit expired, they had the opportunity to continue working there because they had a full-time job. So they can apply, not for an extension, they can apply for a new work permit. So what happened? If they have the, the permanent, the open work permit in the past, and if the vulnerability ends, that means you cannot apply for a new open work permit for vulnerable workers because your vulnerability expired, right? So the option is if you had a full-time job, if you got a full-time and you were lucky, you can apply for the other kind of visas or uh, permits that are allowed in Canada. For example, for the workers that I mentioned, we had the opportunity to apply for a nomination program. We had the opportunity to apply for the new pathway that started one week ago. We uh, already submit three applications for the new pathway of workers that had previously an open work permit. So they meet the requirements. One of the requirements is to be for more than, for more than one year in the a company under the NOC or classification NOC number, this job description, description that is in the pathway of permanent resident. So this is different kind of situation, but we have, of course, another workers that as soon as they expire, they expire the work permit, they have to come back to their countries because they don't have any option. For the agricultural stream, it's different. They cannot apply for an extension, but they have the opportunity to get um, another, another offer of employment and another uh, uh, labor market impact assessment number and the opportunity to apply uh, and apply for restoration of the status under the employer status. So this is another way. But most of the workers, really, most of the workers, they have to come back to their countries because they don't have the requirements for a permanent resident or they don't have a, an offer of employment or they don't have a labor market impact assessment number in order to apply for a new work permit. This is the situation. So, uh, sorry, just continue with my question. Um, so they normally like, they won't get like a red flag back in their countries and that will um, kind of like affect the process of applying for these jobs when they go back to their country. Yeah, it's a really hard situation. It depends. It depends if the worker is lucky. I say lucky because if it's under the seasonal agricultural worker program, they have the all guarantees, all guarantees provided by Mexico and Canada. So uh, if they finish the work uh, before, that means at December 15 every year, they come back to their countries and they come again the next year under the same the same treatment between Canada and Mexico. But the bad part is for the other agricultural streams, the other agricultural workers that they didn't come under the seasonal agricultural worker program. Why? Because they are recruited by different agencies, private agencies, that they didn't guarantee anything. They didn't guarantee if you come to Canada and find a job, if you came to Canada and go your, your, and the terms of the contract is going to meet in Canada, you never know. So this is a, a hard story for the other streams. So it's now you say uh, it's not easy. You, sometimes if they come back to their countries, they even don't have the opportunity to come back to Canada because there are no, uh, um, the recruitment office is not working or sometimes they are recruited for unscrupulous people and they are subject to human rights trafficking or something like that. So it's very hard, especially during this pandemic, it's really hard for them to find another job after the work permit expire. Yeah. 
Great. There is a question in the chat here that uh, do they continue to receive benefits that they received before entering work permit, and if they and if they're staying with their same with the same employer? To him is the question. <laughs> I would as, I would assume this is probably for you, but uh, if, if other ones want to want to comment, that would be great too. But I would assume that it's for you. Okay, so uh, the benefits. The, what kind of benefits are you talking about the employment benefits to me does mean uh, the employment insurance uh, before call the SERP or are you going to talk about the parental um, benefit that they are allowed so there are some benefits that they are that they are allowed because they are migrant workers they are uh, under the the under the employment standards regulations and also under the other temporary foreign workers regulations specifically for them. So uh, what I don't know what benefits, maybe you are talking about that kind of benefits. Um, they will receive the, the, the benefits if they had an open work permit. I say, and if they are staying with the same employer. Of course, if they are staying at the same employer, they will receive the same benefits. If they change employer, they need to get a new benefits from the other employer. That's mean about the, the government benefits, or they never lost the benefits. That's mean because they are regulated on the, the Employment Standards Act. So if you, are a, if you are a worker or under the open work permit or the closed work permit, you have benefits. What benefits? The employment insurance, the parental insurance, and the other kind of benefits that the government gave. But if you are talking about the benefits of the company, the far when the worker is working is different because depends of the employer, because depends of the far. But if you change the employer, you have to see uh, what the far is offering you under the contract. And I know that Connie has her hand up. Uh, Connie, just to finish with this question, um, Loretta uh, added there, Supplementary benefits like dental, medical prescriptions. Depends of the of the employer. I say, uh, in general, all workers in Canada are allowed to any benefits under the open work permit. But it also depends on the employer because if the employer, um, if the company, the contract that you got with the employer is not a full time permanent job, of course, you don't have any benefits because it's a temporary contract. If you get a temporary contract for six months or for probation three months, of course, you don't have benefits like dental or medical. It depends on the, on the company that is hiring the worker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alfredo. And thank you to all the speakers. Francie, you provided a very clear picture of, you know, uh, the open work permit for vulnerable workers, but also the other streams and other types of work permits. And of course, Mitli and Luis for, for the many examples that you presented and to Amari. Um, I just want to add a little bit more and also making like clarifying that when we're talking of the open work permit for vulnerable workers, uh, this is kind of a special a uh, work permit that is granted to workers who are at risk or in an abusive work environment. So it has limitations and this is very short term. As, as what Franci, uh, Franci mentioned, it is you know, the, the prerogative or the discretion of the IRCC for how long you know, the work permit is going to be, but normally it's one year. So, when you are in this open work permit, uh, you have you are given you know a time to look for another uh, employer to be able to get back to a tied work permit situation. Because otherwise, uh, the when when you know when you wait for this work permit to expire and you renew, the the chances that the IRCC officer would not renew this open work permit for vulnerable workers because they would say, you are no longer in that vulnerable situation. So uh, this is, a, 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 I guess, a very 
uh, the clarification that we need or information that we have to provide to you know workers who are approaching us for support. The other the other limitation that you know as already mentioned by everyone, uh, the the onus of proving that you are uh, you are in a vulnerable situation that you are abused that you are at risk lies on the worker. So I would take for example the case of Omari when you know uh, he was arbitrarily terminated, he was not given you know, two weeks notice. He was literally uh, thrown out from, you know, uh, from his workplace. He has nowhere to go. And, and Amari, when you apply, I, I'm very familiar with your case, Amari, because we've talked about this on the phone for, for, yeah, for a long time. And, and you know, when he went to IRCC, uh, to you know, to apply for an open work permit, he has he was sent back to get all the 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 you know the proof. He has to report to the authorities. He has to file a complaint to the labor of uh, Ministry of Labor and all of this. For a worker who who might not know all the you know all the requirements and not knowing how to navigate the system and uh, in Yellowknife, where it's so far away and, and not many service or community organizations providing support, not only that he was already terminated and abused, he was also uh, kind of uh, thrown in a situation where his Amari was completely not aware what to do. So, so while we have, you know, this this uh, kind of you know short term uh, solution, but the information that is being shared to workers and to community organizations is also short in terms of us being able to really provide you know the assistance and the information needed for 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 workers to be able to benefit from this uh, open work permit for vulnerable workers. The other thing too that we need to, to remember. With the public policy, for example, now that is open, uh, allowing you know migrant workers to be able to apply for permanent residency, if you are an, in an open work permit for vulnerable workers, you cannot qualify because one, you are not in a, you are not in a particular NOC or NOC or the national occupational category uh, because you are you know you are in this special. Uh, situation or special circumstance. So for you to be able to access, you know, this permanent pol uh, public policy, you have to have a valid, although the open work permit is valid, it's a valid work permit that is tied to an employer or tied to a particular uh, NLC. So that is another kind of misleading information when, you know, everyone thought, oh, I've completed, you know, 12 months uh, working in this category, but I am on an open work permit right now. Unfortunately, this, that disqualifies you from, you know, from being eligible to apply under the new public policy. Um, it's, 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 uh, while we are saying that, while we are, you know, we're conducting this webinar in relation to uh, the the COVID nineteen pandemic that we are all in and how it's impacting uh, migrant workers, I think, um, yeah, what you've mentioned, Francie, in terms of what are the experiences of migrant workers current currently in Canada and currently impacted by. Uh, COVID-19. So some of the forms of, you know, I would say vulnerability that you mentioned uh, would actually qualify, you know, migrant workers to apply uh, for this work permit. But again, it goes back to the responsibility for the worker uh, to collect this information and proof for him or her to be able to access this, you know, this, this, uh, short-term uh, solution. So I just wanted to, you know, to add that uh, information. Thank you so much, Connie. Uh, <clears throat> we are getting close to the hour, uh, but we have probably room for a couple more questions and I know, or comments too, 
And I know that Luis from uh, FCJ Refugee Center wanted to say something. So Luis, go ahead. Thank you, Alfredo. I just wanted to uh, corroborate to support what uh, uh, Connie said in, uh, about the, I, I understood the extension of the vulnerability. Um, the vulnerability finished in, that, in the place that the worker was working before. However, the, vulner the vulnerability continues because it's in a precarious migration status anyway. Um, and the regulation has been put in a way that they present like an ideal world. However, the low skill uh, workers, labor, particularly those involved in the, in the labor area, in the real life, they, ha they have difficult, it's very difficult for them to access the benefits, for instance, of the employment insurance, for instance, just to mention, to mention one sample. Then the, there are limited access to the Employment Standards Act in the real life. Um, and that is the reason why we, uh, at FCJ, as a part of the CCR and other organizations, we have doing some criticism. We, we say it's positive, it's a good step, the employment, the, the, this open work permit is a good beginning, but it's just the beginning. Because now it's a band-aid, uh, because it's just temporal. We have been successful as well. We have a lot, uh, a, a, a significant number of open work permits approved for our clients. Uh, by the way, most of them have been referred by, from that area uh, by Justicia, Justicia by migra for migrant workers and, and other organization based grounded organizations. But we, alongside with them and the Migrant Rights Network, the MWAC and other organizations, we are still asking a better solution, like for instance, status for all, uh, permanent residency for those who are in a precarious situation, those who already are here with experience, with work, job work experience, uh, already they, 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 they are integrated or they know the, the labor market, then those are a good asset for Canada to be granted with the permanent residency and, and to be incorporated in the, in the economy in, in the proper way, but also in, in the social services, etc., cetera, uh, uh, granting them with the permanent residency. That's just I, I wanted to mention. Uh, we are still doing some criticism to the gaps of this, of this application. Uh, in, it's particularly during the pandemic, it's very difficult for a worker to find a new job and to find a, a, an employer willing to provide a la labor market. And somebody, I don't remember now, it was, it was a Swani or somebody mentioned the, the red flags. And for those who get back to the country, we have found that they are not invited the next year to come when they have been involved here in, in any kind of claims or problem. Then red flags exist, definitely, uh, as Swani. Um, and it's very difficult for them to get back to Canada. That is the, the reason we consider that this, uh, this remedy, this immigration remedy has a lot of gaps. Uh, sorry, I, I would like to mention something maybe quickly uh, to what just uh, Luis said too. And yes, many gaps. And I think the other gap that I, I, I can see or I, can, I am thinking of is like the job, How who helps them or who supports them to find a job. And now they don't have a place to live. Where, where do they go in the meantime? They have to pay for that. How do they find housing and living? So, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking like maybe can they apply to EI to support themselves in that period of time? So is, there is many gaps that I can see. Thanks, Aswani. And um, I'm going to let Connie uh, speak. And then after that, we are going to say some closing uh, words as we are getting close to the hour. So go ahead. Yeah, uh, Aswani, just very briefly, this is the work that we're, you know, <laughs> that we're trying to address under this project when we are, you know, during the pandemic and the impacts of pandemic uh, on workers that we, we are, you know, in a position uh, to provide emergency support to workers who are finding themselves in this situation. So when you ask about uh, how, who and where can they go for support, we have 15 community partners 
who are currently funded under you know the empowering temporary foreign workers project during covid-19 project that they can you know workers or partners can 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 go to and support uh, workers in navigating for example the application for ei the application for open work permit and other emergency support including housing and assisting them in in filing or filing for other benefits and possibly looking for new employment as well. So this is you know, uh, part of uh, the temporary um, uh, service and support that we are providing. Great. Thanks, Connie. Thanks very much. Uh, before I thank uh, everyone, I just wanted to remind you that the next webinar will be on June the 1st. And the subject and you know, the topic is uh, the rights and responsibilities of employers and workers during COVID-19. Um, as we know, there are several regulations that each and every one of us need to follow, uh, but it's always good to, to discuss them and, and ask questions and clarifications. So you are all invited to, to attend on June the 1st. That will be two weeks from now. You should receive hopefully shortly uh, an invitation. So hope to see you then. Uh, it is always great to see, um, uh, I don't want to say, oh, well, I don't want to say all faces. I want to say familiar faces. It's good to see some of you who I haven't seen you for, for you know, quite a number of years probably now. So it's always great to see you. I want to say thanks from the bottom of my heart to all the speakers. I sincerely appreciate your efforts. Um, I want to wish you all the best in your in your work and also in the in whatever processes you're involved with. Amari, I wish you all the best to you and your family. And uh, thank you so much. I hope that you will be able to be in touch with, with some of us here now that we have, uh, uh, you know, the, the pleasure to meet you. And uh, without any further ado, I just want to thank each and every one of you for being with us today. And I want to wish you all the best for the remaining of your day. And since we have a maybe three, four minutes, I'm going to let Aswani, because she put her hand out. Aswani. <laughs> it was not my hand. I was just clapping for the really good oh, presentation. Oh, good, 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 good. All right, thank you. Thank so you. Much. I wasn't it sure. Was, it I was just, a really I thought nice you were going like this. All right, well. Clapping. And good. thank you, Claudia, for give, sharing your experience. Let's give the speakers a hand. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate Thanks it. So and uh, see you next time.